James Clerk Maxwell is often referred to as Scotland's own Einstein. In fact, Einstein once said, the special theory of relativity owes its origins to Maxwell's equations and the electromagnetic field. And Einstein had a picture of Maxwell hanging on his office. And yet the average person on the street wouldn't know who Maxwell was. Yet the same person would be using the fundamental concepts Maxwell is known for and by way of radios, Wi-Fi, cell phones, microwaves, x-rays and medicine and so much more. And that concept is electromagnetic radiation. So in this video, I will briefly introduce you to James Clerk Maxwell and his equations and what they mean and the consequence of what he discovered. Now, I'm not going to delve too much into the mathematics. It is high school physics explained after all. So if you are after some good mathematical explanations, I'll put some links in the description below. So let's get started. Now, before we introduce Maxwell, we need to briefly look at Michael Faraday, who is arguably the greatest experimental scientist of the 19th century. He, in essence, discovered that two seemingly separate domains of physics, that is electricity and magnetism, were intricately linked. He discovered that when, for example, you place a compass near a current bearing wire, it caused the compass to deflect in such a way that the field was circular around the wire. He found out that a current bearing wire placed in a magnetic field will experience a force. And he discovered that when a wire experiences a changing magnetic field, or more correctly, a changing flux, it generates an EMF. But what Michael Faraday lacked was a strong mathematical foundation or background to explain the linkage between magnetism and electricity. So enter James Clerk Maxwell. Maxwell set out to unify these two separate domains mathematically. And he did so by examining four key equations that govern electricity and magnetism. And these became Maxwell's equations. And this is where the mathematics starts. So I don't want to stress you out. Don't worry too much about the formulas themselves. The focus is in what they represent. The first equation is commonly referred to as Gauss's law. And in essence, it's a describing the electric field around a point charge. Now in its simplest form, a positive point charge has a radiating electric field around it. And its value is determined by the distance from that point charge. But the number of field lines, or correctly the electric flux, doesn't change. That is, as you move away, since the field lines are always perpendicular to the surface area of any sphere, it's pretty easy to calculate the value of the strength as the flux per unit area. But what if the surface is not a sphere? In essence, if you divide the surface into many smaller parts and then calculate the flux lines in each area and then add up these areas, you get the total electric flux for this whole area. In essence, that is what integration does. It divides the surface into an infinite number of smaller areas and then adds them up. And the value ends up being the value of the charge divided by epsilon naught. Now epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space and it is a universal constant. So no matter what area you have, the total flux is always equal to the charge divided by epsilon naught. The second equation is analogous to Gauss's law. But instead of dealing with electric fields, it deals with magnetic fields. So here I have a stock standard diagram of a magnet and around it you see the magnetic field lines. Now the magnetic field lines seem to start at the north and end at the south. But in actual fact, the magnetic field lines are continuous loops. So the magnetic field lines are actually passing through the actual magnet like so. So in other words, there is no start there is no finish in terms of the magnetic field lines. They simply go around in a loop. Secondly, the magnet can never be a single pole. What would happen if I chop this magnet in two? Well, I'm going to get two smaller magnets like so. They're going to have a south pole as a result at the bottom and a north pole at the top. In other words, I'm not ever going to get a north pole by itself, a south pole by itself where there is a charge where we have a fixed certain charge and elect, uh, lines of force come off it or come towards it. With my magnet, it acts like a dipole. You always have two and some lines go from it and other lines go towards it. Which means if I examine the lines of flux, let's say at a particular area, and I want to know the total lines of flux 
on this particular area, and this area can be any shape for that matter, then I'm going to have some lines of force that are going to be going out, and I'm going to have other lines of force that are going to go in, which means if I add up all the lines of force in this situation, because my magnet is a dipole, then I'm going to get a sum total of magnetic field lines or flux lines that are going to add up to zero. And that in essence is what the second equation is all about. This aspect here of the formula, the sum total of BDA really means about the magnetic flux, the sum total of the magnetic flux is zero. And that basically is what the second equation states. Now let's move on to the third equation. And basically it describes Faraday's law of induction. Now the way it's often taught in high school is that the EMF equals the rate of change of flux. But what is EMF? EMF is voltage. And voltage is a change in electric field strength. So in essence, a changing magnetic flux causes a changing in an electric field, hence voltage. And in essence, that is what the third equation means. And now to the fourth equation. And it starts with Ampere's law, which basically describes the magnetic field around the current bearing wire. Now in the classroom, it's often simply taught as the magnetic field strength B equals mu naught over two pi multiplied by the current and divided by the distance. But that assumes that the area around it is circular. Ampere's law describes this field with any given area. But it's not completely correct because it relies on the current and thus the field remaining constant. But what if the current changes? When it does, we know that a changing magnetic field will induce an EMF and thus a current. So Maxwell's genius was to tweak the formula to allow for this. In essence, the fourth equation is Ampere's law with changing currents and fields considered. So when Maxwell put them all together, he had a mathematical model that intricately links electricity and magnetism. So this is an example of a unifying theory. And much of physics is about unifying seemingly separate domains. So in this case, Maxwell unifies electricity and magnetism. Now it's at this point that Maxwell took his work a step further to make another discovery. Now first, he noticed that if you change an electric field, you induce a magnetic field. But this changing magnetic field would induce another electric field. And this would start the cycle again. What he did next was look at his four equations and he derived a formula that talks about the electric field and the magnetic field in such a way that they describe a wave, a periodic wave, and you can see that by this cos term. Now again, I'm going to sound like a broken record here. Do not worry about the mathematics. What's important here is, is that Maxwell took his equations and was able to describe the relationship between the electric field and the magnetic field in what we refer to as a waveform. In other words, it is generating a wave that has a specific wavelength and a specific speed. And he noted that when the electric field is at a maximum, the magnetic field is at a maximum. So in other words, the two waves that are generated, the electric field and the magnetic field, are in phase with each other. Secondly, the electric field and the magnetic field are at 90 degrees to each other. And in fact, because they are at 90 degrees to each other, so one is going, let's say, in that direction, and the other one is going to go in that direction, that results when those two combine produce a wave that goes in that direction like so. So it has a particular speed. So what you have is a transverse wave that is in essence a fluctuating electric field and this would generate a fluctuating magnetic field at right angles to it. And each field would cause the other. If you start with a charge and you move it up and down, you would generate a wave that would self-propagate. In essence, an electromagnetic wave. This wave would require no medium, no substance to travel through. So here is our fluctuating EMR wave. And we have here in red, the fluctuating electric field. And as I said, when we have a fluctuating electric field, we have also a generating fluctuating magnetic field which is seen here in the blue. 
If I change the angle, you can see they are 90 degrees to each other. And you can also see that when the electric field is a maximum, so is the magnetic field. If I change the wavelength of it, then you'll see that my frequency as a result also changes. So if I have a longer wavelength, I have a lower frequency. If I'm going to have a shorter wavelength, I'm going to have a higher frequency and it travels at a set speed. But what is that speed? He then set out to determine the speed of this wave. And by rearranging his equations, he got the speed to be equal to one over the square root of E naught multiplied by mu naught, the permittivity of free space multiplied by the permeability of free space. This ended up being equal to around 300,000 kilometers per second, which he knew was extremely similar to the known speed of light. Either this was a massive coincidence or light was a form of electromagnetic wave. And of course we know it's the latter. And therefore you could have an electromagnetic wave that was not visible simply because it had differing wavelengths and frequency. And the race was on, so to speak, for physicists to demonstrate experimentally the existence of electromagnetic waves apart from light. Now this was finally achieved by Heinrich Hertz with his discovery of radio waves. Now I have a video on that which covers this and you'll find the link at the end of the video. Now Maxwell did not live long unfortunately and died of cancer in 1879. But we owe him much as he formed the foundation for Einstein and the understanding of fields and for us much of the technology we rely on today. So this includes the video you are watching right now. Maxwell deserves to be remembered as one of the founding fathers of modern physics. Thanks for watching. Please remember, like, share and subscribe. And by the way, drop a comment down below if the video particularly has been useful. And finally, consider supporting me via Patreon. The idea is to develop resources and equipment to continue to teach physics at a high school level. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.